figure that out. Oh, friends, welcome to the woods. I'm thinking of everybody at our Bolingbrook campus, Three Rivers campus, South Naperville, Naperville, Wheaton, and online friends. Welcome to the woods and our series called David, the Life of a King. Did you, did you hear that? I, I think that was a bear. Friends, I just saw some scat right over there. And it turns out that in this very woods recently, there were bear sightings. I don't know how you feel about bear. They terrify me. I gotta show you where we're at, come here. We start here at 6 with a big surprise for neighbors in North Suburban Gurney today. This is certainly not something you want to see when you're dropping your kid off at daycare. Take a close look here. You'll see a bear caught on video roaming around near the Gurney Mills Mall. Friends, welcome to Gurney Mills Mall. This is so weird for the Griffin family. We lived up in Lake County, and this was our mall for 20 years. And for me to think of a wild bear walking around that parking lot is so crazy. But it's true, the bear have moved into Illinois. Friends, Wisconsin has got a huge population of 24,000 natural residing bear and Illinois is not at any but the Wisconsin population has grown so much that it's pushing them south and there are now bear in Illinois which in some ways seems right to me it's always kind of bothered me that the Packer territory's got lots of bears and that Chicago bear territory has none right what's the justice in that and so the Lord being a bear fan has driven them into our territory I say welcome bears but I also feel the need to give some guidance on how to interact with bears you know we Illinoisans are ignorant about policy and so I've taken a look I, I've actually got a brochure here of the Illinois Department of Natural Resources who gives us guidelines on how to handle an encounter with a bear and the first point I'd like to make is that the guidelines are clear that we are not allowed to kill hunt or even harass a bear it's law harass means to upset friends you cannot upset a bear you must be nice to it. And so that's kind of the first principle, be nice to the bears. All right, but there's more. It also says, don't run. Whatever you do, don't run. They love to chase and then eat people. So if you see a bear, though your legs are saying, go, your brain must say, stay. Just stay right there. In fact, I got more. The next principle is stand your ground. The guidelines actually say, stand tall, wave your hands. The idea is you want to power up, look big to the bear, intimidate it, but don't harass it. You know what I mean? You need to intimidate in a nice way. You can handle that, can't you? And that brings us to our next, which is talk to the bear. No kidding. It turns out that bear identify people by hearing them talk. Some scientists say that many bear attacks were based on the bear misidentifying the prey. They, they thought it was one of their natural prey, but in fact it was a human being. They thought it was, I don't know what, a, a, a deer, a goose. Turns out bear are not that smart. Although don't tell the bear that, that would be harassing him. We must be nice and power up and talk to them. Just say, hey, Mr. Bear, how you doing, man? I, I just wanted to hang out. And, and not scare you, but show you I am big. So talk to the bear. Preferably, it turns out since the bear migrate from Wisconsin, if you wanna make sure they recognize the human voice, use a Wisconsin accent. I could teach you that, but I'd get in trouble. So I'm gonna have to ask you to research the Wisconsin accent on your own time. And then the next point it says is if you have food in hand, you need to drop it. I guess holding delicious food in your hand is just like tempting the bear. So no matter how much you like the food, let it fall, friends. Let go, you can buy some more. And that brings us next to this rather confusing detail, but it's important to know. And it has to do with playing dead. Maybe you've heard that you should 
play dead on the ground. Yes, if it is a brown bear, you want to pretend you're dead. But turns out if it's a black bear, don't pretend you're dead. You have got to fight back. In fact, I have a little, little saying here that'll help you remember. Brown lay down, black fight back. And by fighting back, friends, you gotta lean into it. You know, a little slap isn't gonna do much for the bear. You gotta give him a hard undercut or to the nose, or if you can get around behind him, put him in a chokehold really tight, yeah. Good luck with that. So, when you fight, when you play dead, brown lay down, black fight back. So you gotta first discern, is this a brown bear or a black bear? Friend, if you've got color blindness, my sympathy to you, I don't know how to guide you in that situation. You are in trouble. And that brings us to this simple reminder, friends, that the bear is an apex predator, which means it's a killer. It's at the top of the food chain. Nothing threatens the bear, but the bear can eat anything, including us. Bear have come to Illinois, but I don't think that the bear is the species we need to be most fearful of. Truthfully, in our area, it's gonna be a while before the bear get down to the western, southwestern suburbs. What we need to fear as far as other organisms harming us is a species known as Homo sapiens. Friends, we need to worry about people. Other people are the most harmful reality in the world we live. We live in a dangerous place because people are cruel. People desire to say things and do things that hurt you. And so anyone living on this world has got to learn the art of handling hurtful people. Bears, whether that's useful or not, it's not so important. But we're about to open the Bible and learn from the example of David how to deal with hurtful people. So friends, the apex predator of human beings is other human beings. Let's turn to the story of David. You, you may be looking at my props here, seeing a couple birds and a hatchet and think we're gonna butcher some fowl. No, that's not the case at all. I've got three props for three points as we study how David dealt with harmful people. The person is a guy by the name of Shimei. Let me read. This is first, I'm sorry, second Samuel 16, six. As King David approached Bahurim, a man from Saul's clan came out and his name was Shimei. And so what do we know about this? First of all, he's from the town of Bahurim. Turns out we left David last week. Do you remember he was going up the Mount of Olives? Well, on the far side of the Mount of Olives is this town. David, if you recall, was weeping as he went up the Mount of Olives because he is running from his own son. His son, Absalom, has done a, a coup and taken over the throne. And David is fleeing from his, for his life, knowing that his own son, the new king, wants to kill him. And when he, in this sad march, comes across this town, this guy from Saul's family. Remember, Saul was the first king of Israel, then David. And so this guy is not a good guy. As we're about to see, this Shimei is a bum. And his cruelty is obvious as we press on. Friends, uh, the first point is going to be connected to the duck. And, and I have an idiom here. What I'm going to do is, with each point, there's an idiom that kind of speaks to a popular principle but then we'll see how the Bible drives that principle even deeper. So what's the first idiom? It is like water off a duck's back. As we're about to see, this Shimei is going to launch a, a, a shower of horrible insults at David. And it'll, by God's grace, roll off his back. You ready? 2 Samuel 16, 6. Shimei cursed David and pelted him with stones. 
He said, you scoundrel, the Lord has repaid you for all the blood that you shed in the household of Saul, in whose place you have reigned. You've come to ruin because you're a murderer. Friends, these things are not true. David was not killing people in Saul's household. Saul was trying to kill David, if you recall, but David was profoundly respectful to Saul and his household. But this Shimei, being from the household of Saul, he's jealous that the throne went from Saul's family to David's family. And his bitterness is just being poured out. I mean, this is the kind of guy who hits you when you're down. David's already at the lowest point where everything is crumbling. And this guy wants to kick him in the teeth as David is so, so sorrowful. Look what uh, David's guy says, uh, verse 9. Abishai said to the king, why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over and cut his head off. <laughs> I want to lop his head off. And it's understandable that this uh, loyal soldier of David's would want to defend David. But look what the king says, verse 11. Then David said to Abishai, no, no, leave him alone. Let him curse me, for the Lord has told him to. David's thinking a lot about these curses that he's getting from this, this uh, Shammai. And David says, I think God may be in this. He says, you know, I know that hardship sometimes is the Lord's doing. I know that God allows, sometimes causes, I'm not sure exactly what he's doing, but it's, it's a God thing. This humiliating, painful season is the will of God for my life right now. And I'm going to try to endure it well. Uh, David goes on in verse 12 to say, It may be that the Lord will look upon my misery and restore to me his covenant blessing. In other words, God's watching me, how I endure this misery. And if I endure it well, God may honor those who honor him. He may in turn and give me great blessing because of how faithfully and with high integrity I endure this great hardship. And so with this thought of God's watching eyes, David marches on with humility and with faithfulness. Look at verse 13. So David and his men continued along the road while Shammai was going along the hillside opposite him, cursing as he went, throwing stones at David and showering him with dirt. <laughs> this guy's got handfuls of dirt he's chucking at David and rocks and curses and insults. And David just humbly receives it and presses on. It's amazing. What principle is it bringing us to? And that is endure mistreatment heroically. You know, David's got thick skin, to use another idiom. The, the insults are like water rolling off a duck's back. But to drive it deeper, in David's mind, enduring this mistreatment is Honoring God. You know, sometimes our obedience is most meaningful the Lord, to the Lord when it's most difficult for us. And David willing to say, this is part of my journey. Losing the throne, hated by my own son, hunted by my own son, insulted by this guy named Shammai. And David says, I'll walk that path and I'll do so with dignity for the glory of God. God's watching. Maybe he'll bless me as a result of it. I don't know but I'm going to honor God with how I handle this season of insult. Friends, that's so beautiful. Endure mistreatment heroically. Do you view hardship as an opportunity to worship God with enduring faithfully? Um, I, have a, I have a friend, a friend of my wife's and a friend of mine. She came to me once, and actually to me and Jen said, uh, my friend and my pastor, I need wisdom. She said, I got a mother-in-law who's going to drive me crazy. Her, her mother-in-law was just cruel and hateful. And as we wrestled in discussion uh, on this topic, it became evident to her that she's like, you know what? This is a path I got to walk. I need to cling to Jesus for the strength to endure this with integrity and character. 
And she worshiped God by enduring the pummeling of poor treatment she got from her mother-in-law. What's so beautiful is that her mother-in-law was so softened by her gracious response that today mother-in-law has grown in Christ and is actually a far kinder mother-in-law. And I just, I see the victory that was won. Now, I do want to point out that this doesn't mean we're always like water on a duck's back saying, give it to me, give it to me. Sometimes we must boundary from unhealthy people. And you say, well, when do I boundary and stay away from them? And when do I walk faithfully through their mistreatment? May the Holy Spirit guide you in that important decision. There are, there are spouses who are abusive and God doesn't want us to be physically mistreated in that way. And drawing a boundary and creating separation at times is necessary for our own well-being. At other cases, like my friend's endurance with her mother-in-law or David enduring through uh, Shimei, we just got to say, God, guide me as to when it's time to boundary and when it's time to endure. And so that, that brings us to our, our second point, the hatchet, which speaks of an idiom that says, bury the hatchet. You know, a hatchet can be used as a weapon. And so to bury it means I'm not going to fight back. I'm not going to return mistreatment for mistreatment. And we find David encounter this guy Shammai again. Uh, much later, in fact, it's years later when uh, what happened is Absalom and his army attacked his dad and his soldiers. And in that attack, Absalom died. And with the death of this rebellious son, David is invited back to Jerusalem to be throned king once again. And as David is now coming back to Jerusalem, this guy Shammai, who had insulted him when David was leaving Jerusalem, Shammai comes back. Let me show you where it says this. Now I'm in chapter 19 of 2 Samuel. And it says this, Shammai crossed the Jordan. That's the Jordan River. He wanted to get close to David as he's approaching on his return to Jerusalem. Shammai crossed the Jordan. He fell prostrate before the king and he said... I did wrong on the day the king left Jerusalem. I know that I've sinned, but today I have come here as the first to meet my Lord, the king. Very convenient. You know, he had a, a hatred of David expressed in insults when David was being stripped of his power. But now that David is having his power returned, this guy is like, I'm just kidding. You know, that was a mistake. I really am very loyal. As we're going to see, this is not authentic repentance. And yet David is going to show grace. Let me show you what Abishai says. Verse 21, Abishai says, shouldn't Shammai be put to death for this? He cursed the Lord's anointed. You know, he's saying, David, now that you're back in power, you have the authority to execute this justice. And sure enough, in the Old Testament, throwing a curse to a ruler was an offense, a law-breaking offense. And so this guy's like, this guy needs to be put to death. But David won't do it. Verse 22, David said, should anyone be put to death in Israel today? Don't I know that today I am king over Israel again. David is like, this is a good day. I, I, in God's grace, am being restored to my throne. And yes, I could turn on a lot of people, but I'm not going to turn on any of them. This is so interesting. You know, typical kings, when there's been a whole rebellion, would have wiped out everybody who had joined his son Absalom. David showed grace to them all. It reminds me of Abraham Lincoln and his controversial decision to show grace to the Confederacy after the, the Northern uh, US won the Civil War. David's gonna show grace to the enemy, if you will. And particularly the guy who had insulted him, you know, chopping off the head would have been a natural inclination. But David said, no, uh, no, I'm, I'm not going to uh, bring evil against the one who brought evil against me. If it says in verse 23, so the king said to Shammai, but you shall not die. You should die, but you shall not die. And the king promised him on oath. 
I'm not going to kill you for this. I promise. This brings us to a point that was stated by Jesus, and I'll use his words. Christ said, love your enemy. I think you may see how this takes it even further. The, the basic principle is sometimes you should bury the hatchet and not seek revenge. Jesus says, not only do I tell you not to seek revenge, I want you to love them. Don't just not do them harm. Christ goes further. Treat them well. And we see David implementing that. As David puts his arm around this Shammai and says, listen, buddy, I'm going to give you an oath. An oath you don't deserve, but I'm going to give it nonetheless. I will never treat you poorly for what you've done to me. Wow. Friends, one of the great callings is when you've been mistreated, not only do you want to endure it heroically, you want to love your enemy and say, I'm not going to lash back. I'm so tempted to. But in my commitment to Christ, I won't do it. I, 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 in high school, I endured a, a guy who was a bully. It just made my life miserable. And wouldn't you know, years later when I was in college, I was the manager of a park pool. And who applied for a job but my old bully? In that uh, moment, as I hired him, and now I've got authority over him, I'm like, oh, I could make him miserable. I could make him clean toilets every day. But I knew the principle of Jesus Christ to love my enemy. And so by God's help, I went out of my way to love him. Amazingly, that bully became a believer and is a dear friend of mine today. Isn't that a kingdom of God thing. But I'll never forget my decision that though I want to make things even, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to follow in the ways of Jesus. I, I challenge us to do likewise. Well, that brings us to point three and the chicken. And what's the idiom here? Chickens come home to roost. Chickens come home to roost. Let's, let's learn, shall we? Uh, 1 Kings 2, we're actually all the way out of 2 Samuel, now into 1 Kings. This is when David is on his deathbed. It's interesting, we're seeing the last words that David's giving to Solomon, his son, who will be the next king. And what David says is this, 1 Kings 2, 8. He says, Solomon, you got to remember this Shammai who called down bitter curses on me. Do not consider him innocent. You are a man of wisdom, son. You will know what to do with him. Now, it's so interesting. Apparently, the fact that Shammai's repentance was not genuine, that bore itself out over the years. David's like, I'm telling you, this guy's a bum. He has proven himself to be wicked. And yet David's like, I made a promise that I would not bring justice upon him. So I haven't. Now, Solomon, when I die, you will be in charge. And I trust you will do with Shammai what you know to do. And so David lets go and entrusts to his son and to his Lord how to handle this Shammai. Look what happens. After David dies, in verse 36, we find this. The king, now Solomon, he sent for Shammai, and he said to him, all right, here's the plan. Build yourself a house in Jerusalem and live there, but do not go anywhere else. The day you leave, you can be sure that you will die. It's like Solomon's putting him on house arrest. He's saying, Shammai, I know you're worthy of death, but in grace, I've decided that I'm not going to execute you. But I am going to keep you in Jerusalem where I can keep an eye on you. You're not allowed to leave the city. On the day you leave, that's it. It's a very gracious move. Well, Shammai again shows his true colors. Look at verse 41. Solomon was told that Shammai left Jerusalem. The one thing he was told not to do. Verse 44, the king got him and the king said to Shammai, now the Lord will repay you for your wrongdoing. That's so interesting. Solomon's going to execute justice and execute the guy, but he knows he's acting as a servant of the Lord. The Lord will repay you. 
And sure enough, that's what happens. Verse 46, it says, Solomon gave the order to Benai, and he went out and struck Shammai down. Friends, the principle uh, that I want to look at here, I'm going to state it in this way. Let God repay. Let God repay. How does the chicken remind us of this? Well, the, the idiom, again, is that chickens come back to roost. It's a basic principle of inevitable justice that even non-believers have observed in the world, that you reap what you sow. What goes around comes around. Just as the chicken will leave the roost, it'll eventually come back. And the principle is that if you treat people really poorly, eventually justice will send it back around to you. Now, where does this go deeper in the case of believers? It's in this, that we believe God's the one who brings the justice back around. We're not just hoping in fate. We're hoping in the Lord, who is the king of kings and the one in charge. And so when we say, hey, I'm not going to execute justice, but I'm going to trust the Lord, we can rest knowing that the Lord will bring justice according to his wisdom. When David spoke to his son. He's like, listen, I, I'm not going to be the one to bring justice on this guy who has harmed me so much. I'm going to trust you, son. But more importantly, I'm going to trust the Lord to do what's right. And Solomon said, the Lord is going to repay. This is God's deal. I'm the one who's being used by God. But Solomon understood the Lord's repaying, which points to a principle in Romans I'd like to read. Romans 12, 19 says this. Friends, don't take revenge, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Friends, when we don't seek justice ourselves, when we let the person go, if you will, we're not letting them off the hook as much as entrusting them to the Lord. The Lord will bring to bear justice as he sees fit. And so how are we able to let go of our anger and bitterness? We're able to because we turn them over to God. And we say, Lord, if that guy, that gal needs to be punished, I trust you'll bring it back around and bring appropriate punishment. I can let go. I don't have to burn with anger, with resentment, because you're the avenger, God, you will repay. David let go. You know, it's been said that those who hold bitterness in spite, they're really making themselves a prisoner. When they let go, it's not so much that they're releasing the hurtful person. They're releasing themselves out of a prison of resentment. And so, friends, don't hold on to bitterness. Let go. Trust God to execute justice as he knows is best. And so if we could do a quick review, endure hardship heroically, love your enemy, and let God repay. You know, I'd like to end with a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who said, have we not come to such an impasse in the modern world that we must love our enemies? Or else the chain reaction of evil, hate begetting hate, wars producing more wars, must be broken or else we shall be plunged into the dark abyss of annihilation. You know, he reminds us that this loving our enemies, yes, it's for us and our own heart, but even more than that, it's for our world. If, if we don't start living towards hurtful people in this grace-filled way, we're perpetuating a cycle of hate that will destroy the planet. God's people, Christians, must hear the words of Jesus, love your enemy, and get really good at living in a hate-filled world and breaking the chain of evil. May we do it for the world, may we do it for the Lord, and may we do it for the health of our own heart. Friends, will you pray with me? Lord, it is a cruel planet. And we long to respond to the cruel people we inevitably rub shoulders with. We long to respond in a way 
that Jesus taught us. Would you help us implement these principles like David did and be gracious at an amazing level? May it bring you glory. May it make the world a better place. And may our heart soar with freedom as a result. This is what we pray in Christ's name. Amen.